The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of CNS Channel 6. Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to Matters of Public Importance right here on Channel 6. I'm yours, Gail Tushera, Chief Whip for the Parliamentary Opposition, People's Progressive Civic, Parliamentarians, and the People's Progressive Party. On this program, we shall focus, as always, on matters of public importance, bring you information and discussions on issues and matters of concern to you, the Guyanese public, every Thursday between 12.30 and 1.30, right here on Channel 6. And as usual, before we get into the meat of the program, I remind you of the telephone numbers 225-0010 and 225-008. As I always remind you that the Office of the Lead the Opposition is open at 304 Church Street between New Garden and Peter Rose Street, right opposite the Border Cricket Ground. And we're open Monday to Friday all day and then half day Saturdays. So you're welcome to come over and seek advice or just to pop in and see, say hello to people. It's 225-3432 is the switchboard number. Please feel free to call in advance or whether you just want to call and, and speak to someone about a problem or an issue you would like to have clarified. And some of you, of course, are familiar with Freedom Radio, which continue, continues to broadcast at 91.1 Demerara, 90.5 Burbies, and 90.7 Escribo. And the mirror continues, and you can access it at www.facebook.com weekend slash weekend mirror news. And so you can download the Mirror newspaper um, free of charge and read the contents. It's, uh, it is a very, it has some very good articles and, of course, photographs and so on that you might find of interest. Well, this is the third week. We shall be focusing on the fundamental anti-working people, anti-working class nature of the APNU AFC government. And why am I saying that? And that's what this program will, like the last two programs, relate to why we're saying that they're anti-working people. Well, first of all, September 1st signals the beginning of the Armenian Heritage Month. And we extend greetings to all our Armenian brothers and sisters across Guyana on this annual recognition by all Guyanese and our nation itself of the contributions of the Amerindian peoples to our heritage and our nation, starting almost 11,000 years ago. As Guyanese, regardless of our ethnicity, we should be proud to live in a nation of such rich cultural diversity and heritage. Unfortunately, this period has been marred by the continuous anti-development posture of this APNU AFC government to the Armenian peoples. The first major anti-worker action of this government was against 1,972 Amerindian community service officers who were the first to feel the heavy hand of the government in its first three months of office. With the loss of these jobs, 1,972 jobs, of this sizable number of workers who approximately had 10,000 dependents, $700 million was removed from these village economies, thereby exacerbating their access to goods and services and deepening poverty and economic activities. $20 million here and there from the President's grants to some villages cannot replace the impact of $700 million that has been removed from the purchasing power of these people, the, the community service officers and their families, and the removal of the purchasing power that has affected the villages and the regional economies. No Armenian communal titles have been granted in the last three years, and they're setting up a parallel structures to undermine elected bodies, undermining the Armenian Act, etc., and so on. And we will specifically deal with this issue as we go along in the month of Armenian heritage. But today I want to focus on the anti-working people nature of the APNU AFC government. And so the first victims of this fundamental policy of the government were the indigenous people and the 1,972 community service officers. Next, they sent home hundreds of public servants from the high and middle managerial levels down to the lower levels of the public service, including cleaners and drivers who the government felt were PVP supporters based on their ethnicity or how they were seen to be in support of the People's Progressive Party. And this trend has continued throughout. The third major wave of anti-worker activity by the government was the closure of the Wales estate, sending home almost 2,000 workers in December 2016. The fourth wave came next with the closure of Enmore, Skeldon and Rose Hall estates, where a further 5,000 workers lost their jobs. 
This was done without any economic and social impact assessment and against the contradiction in the recommendation, sorry, of the COI and sugar that said any closure of any estates would have catastrophic effects on the industry and the nation. We see the Im impact of this every day at the family, community and national levels. As of today, the severance pay for these workers, as required by law, has not been paid out. Some got partial payment early this year and were promised a balance in the second half of the year. We're in the second half of the year and no one has said a thing. And the president at his third press conference on becoming president more than three years ago could give no hope except that they're looking for money. At a conference on sugar uh, that was held this week by the by GAO and a union called Unifor, a major Canadian trade union, condemn this violation of the labor laws that are protected not only in our own statutes, our own laws, but internationally by ILO conventions that Ghana has ratified. The Ghana Trade Union Congress and the FITUK came out at the end of the conference with a resolution supporting the sugar workers and teachers. I'm waiting to hear the Ghana Public Service Union lend support as the public servants are watching this, this present strike, the teachers' strike, with profound interest, as they were also promised before the 2015 elections by the APNU AFC, of one, the reinstatement of collective bargaining and a 20% increase in salaries across the board to public servants within the first 100 days. Neither promise has been delivered. The fifth wave we have seen unfolding with the teachers since December 2015 to the present leading to thousands of teachers striking. The teachers' strike started on Monday, August the 27th, and has continued in the first week of the second term, of school term. The response of the government to the teachers and the GTU thus far has been unacceptable, uncaring, and potentially unlawful. We understand there may be another meeting today between the GTU and the Ministry of Education. The GTU has made it clear last week that it is time to go to arbitration. The announcement last week that quote, due to you will call up the strike if conditions are met, end quote, is a reflection of their continued desire and I believe hope that the government will see the light and respond positively. We shall see today what the government has to offer the teachers. Don't hold your breath too long. The union announced that teachers are willing to call off a countrywide strike only if a request by the GTU for arbitration is accepted among others. As you know, mandatory conciliatory talks between the GTU and the Ministry of Education was supervised by the Department of Labor uh, at a meeting held last week. At the meeting, the union proposed that the two parties held head into arbitration to resolve issues surrounding salary increase ne negotiations. The union wants the arbitration panel to comprise of an independent chairperson and representatives of the GTU and Ministry of Education. That is in the law and therefore they're complying with the law. <coughs> the union has expressed that it does not, uh, that the Labour Department is not in a position to act as arbiter, since it was part of the government's delegation that was persuading the teachers to accept the Ministry 700 ballpark offer. The union, therefore, is proposing that the strike be called off on the following terms no victimization by either party, no loss of pay and seniority, that the issues that led to the strike be referred to an arbitration panel that the chairperson shall be agreed on upon before the resumption of work and the status quo ante, that is, before the strike, shall be respected by everyone involved in the situation. This proposal is in total compliance with the labor laws of Guyana. It will be interesting to see the government and the Ministry of Labor's response to this proposal. Let's, let's go through the issues. The teachers under the PPC had successfully won two multi-year agreements with regards to their salaries and benefits. I noticed that Coretta MacDonald, General Secretary of the Ghana Trade Union Congress and GS of the GTU, a very powerful woman who has an enormous constituency both in the teachers and in the union movement, referred to this fact in her speech to teachers at the GTU Hall two days ago and has been upbraided by the President Union and she has apologized. The fact is, it is, is that the teachers got more under the PVPC government. One cannot wish away the facts. What Coretta said, who has been at the helm of the leadership of the union and who has sat in several negotiations, 
with previous and current administrations, um, shows that she has a lot of understanding and experience in this. This is what she said, and this is what she's apologizing for, apparently. If you look at what transpired under the PPP government when they were in power and what is transpiring now, remember we don't want the five, we didn't want the 5%, we made noise about it. But with the 5%, we got a whole lot of non-salary benefits, she said to a loud applause from the large gathering of teachers. She continued, for the first time in the history of this country, our teachers were able to get clothing allowance, duty-free concessions and allowance for additional qualifications. While the PVP government was in power, and you know I don't want to sound political, but we have to make the comparison because of all the untruths, untruths they're peddling out there, end quote. The GTU official went so far as to say that the current David Granger-led administration is playing with the teacher's emotions. Quote, to say to us that this thing is just three and something years since they're in government, and this is the party that most of the teachers supported. So is our party. And our party don't work when you go in the market. Our party ain't working when you have to pay rent. Our party don't work when you have to face the bank to repay your mortgage. So our party's dead, she declared. So I think that's more what she's being asked to apologize on a reference to the PVP. But I leave it to Coretta. Meanwhile, the GTU president uh, lied, debunked claims that he has political ties to any one party, much less the PVP. He said at one time he was accused of being associated with the People's National Congress, and now he's being accused of being a supporter of the opposition PPP. He says, quote, it seems as though every time you stand up for a just cause, people put a political spin to it. I don't have a party card from either party or any third party. I represent teachers, and that is what I will continue to do, end quote, Mr. Light. The union, as you know, submitted its proposal for a multi-year agreement after the expiration of the 2010-2015 agreement on the December 31st, 2015. Negotiations began in 2016 January and continued sporadically for 22 months. In May 2016, the, the union had declared that if the then stall negotiations didn't continue within the next month, then teachers would take drastic action. This action never materialized, nor did the negotiations continue beyond a few meetings. Instead, in September 2016, the teachers, like all other public servants, were treated to differentiated increases, ranging from 10% to 1%. And the same Coretta McDonald, GTU's General Secretary, referred to the increase as an imposition. President Granger's statement on Friday at his third press conference that the government is now seeking to mobilize funds to make a better pay offer to teachers is a cause of great concern. It appears that the government assumed that the GTU and teachers would not go out just on strike, and, they would, and the government would continue to control the union due to past political experiences, and therefore there was no need for the government to make any budgetary uh, or contingency provisions for the teachers in the 2018 budget, despite the fact that the same president established a joint task force in October 2017 to prevent what was a, tr uh, a, a strike call in that period by the union. The president mentioned on Friday that the mobilization of funds also has to be done to finance the severance pay of thousands of sugar workers. Another example, I guess, of the government being unable to plan financially for its own policies. But again, we're looking at trying the whole issue of trying to divide and rule and play workers against each other. He then plays the sugar workers against the, union, the teachers. This is how he operates. One of the interesting things notable is that the president has ruled out negotiations between his government and the Guyana Teachers Union on a multi-year agreement that would address benefits for the over 13,000 public school teachers in Guyana. This is at his press conference. However, he admitted to the need for a multi-year agreement. Yes, we need a multi-year agreement, he said, but now is not the time, he said. Right now, people are preoccupied with day-to-day -day issues. Huh? What is, what is that? Did you understand that? Come on, Mr. President, do you recognize what you just said? So isn't this strike about day-to-day -day issues? Aren't strike by workers for better pay and benefits and allowances to do with day-to-day -day issues, to bread and butter issues, aren't bread and butter issues day-to-day -day issues? So you're not gonna deal with a multi-year agreement, it's not the right time right now. Right now, people are preoccupied with bread and butter issues. Hmm. 
that's an issue that I could write a couple of pages on a letter to the editor about just that phrase by the president. But I leave it to you to ponder, my listeners and viewers. This week, the union and teachers have been told they are selfish and uncaring by the Minister of Labor, the person supposed to be part of resolving the issues according to the law. And, of course, he was forced to apologize this week. This will not, I believe, rectify the damage that he has done. He is clearly, despite an apology, not an impar impartial actor in the resolution of the teacher's demands. And note, he didn't apologize for calling Armenian people avaricious and unpatriotic in 2017. Maybe as it's Armenian Heritage Month, and he has made one apology, he could proceed to make another, to apologize to all the Armenian people for having made such an outrageous and racist comment. But you know, I think you know what I think. I doubt he will. It's almost two years, he's said nothing. And he's only saying the issue of the trade union, the teachers, is because he knows the government wants to keep conciliation talks going instead of going to arbitration. They better get him to apologize, which is what they did. So, the Ministry of Education and the Department of Public um, Information has put out media statements have tried to show that strikers had no impact. There have been misinformation about the number of schools that have been closed, the number of t teachers that are on strike, etc. And I have walked to the studio today with photographic evidence and with video evidence to show that the strike is having quite an enormous impact on, on the workers, on the schools, and hopefully the government will stop being so hard ears and listen to the teachers. The union has correctly mobilized its membership across the country. And these photos show the militancy of the teachers, the majority of them are female. And so this is a union that is heavily dominated by female workers, like the public service union. And these are women who have to manage their families as well. So don't the children of the teachers count as well? Or is it only the, te the children that the teachers are teaching that count, according to the government, that is? But the teachers have to pay the bill. They have to, will now have to pay the um, minibus increases and the proposed increase for water. They pay VAT as well. They have to buy materials for their classrooms for out of their own pocket in order to be able to run their classes. So don't they count? Don't they count? And so I wanted to, while I'm talking and I'm going to, as you see some of the photographs, you will, and the videos, I'll explain to you wh which part of the country they're from. So you won't see me, but you'll hear me. Right? <clears throat> These are areas in, in Georgetown. And uh, some of the placards that you're seeing that are being <coughs> presented. These are in front, of course, one of the Ministry of Education buildings. Some very good uh, post, uh, posters uh, or placards that they've done. Um, these are also in others that looks like I can't see very well from here, but that's Spartica. Right next to a Granger D bus. I thought that was a really interesting place to have their uh, picketing. That's also Spartica that you're watching in there. Spartica. Spartica. This again is in in Georgetown, so that uh, you can see some of the workers. Um, this is in Letham, I believe. Yeah, that's Letham. Can you imagine? Letham had their own picketing and protest. The teachers stood out strong. This is West Coast, I believe. West Coast Demerara, that is. And so a number of places are West Coast, um, Esquibo. These again in, it looks like New Amsterdam, but I could be wrong. Um, that looks like a quibble. This is Linden. This is Linden on the Monday, the first day. Um, I don't know if you're hearing the sound, but it's um, working like a donkey, paying us like a junkie. Uh, they make us like a don donkey and pay us like a junkie. That's what they say. This is Linden. 
And I understand they continue to have their protest action every day of the week so far. Uh, this is uh, Georgetown uh, Ministry of Education, I believe. So what you're seeing is a uh, coming out of teachers, majority female, who uh, right across this country, from the bottom of Ghana, the tip of Ghana, Lethem, uh, right through to our um, eastern part of Ghana, that is uh, Bardica, then you come to Georgetown, you go Esquibo, um, sorry, Esquibo, and then Georgetown, West Coast, and so forth, Burbies. So you're seeing uh, teachers taking very seriously that after two, uh, such a long time, they've been very patient, and they now believe that they have to go and make their voices heard. And I sincerely hope that the government will take this seriously. And I'll show you how they're going to be able to pay for the salary increases that are demanded by the teachers. Despite these protests that are now in the fourth day, they did have last week uh, protests as well in Esequibo and other areas. Um, this looks to be uh, West Coast, West Bank, Region 3. Um, these are teachers in that area there. And I understand that uh, the government has police and others monitoring uh, these protests and picketing, as well as going to schools to check on who turned up to work or not. That's a rumor, I don't know if it's true or not. This is Coretta McDonald speaking to the teachers at the Union Hall where she made the statements about the, um, the comparison of this government's treatment of teachers versus the treatment of the PBPC in government with two multi-year agreements. audio so um, what what I read to you is what has been in the report in the press so that you can hear her actually say that in case someone says I'm making up a story about her Miss McDonald that she is a very forceful and powerful speaker and also a very strong representative of the uh, workers particularly teachers which she is that's where her background is from she emerged from the, the teaching profession The government has remained, I hope you saw those photographs for yourself, so all this talk about, you know, nothing's happening. If you can imagine the, the teachers in Lethem, walking around Lethem, it looks like 40 other of them walking around Lethem, um, having their own picketing. So this is not a Georgetown affair. This is not a, this is a countrywide concern of all the teachers in the system. And so these are photographs and videos that, that I was able to access. But I'm sure in a number of the communities, they, they, Facebook and others have others that I haven't seen as yet. The government has remained intransigent, and the Ministry of Education has even stated repeatedly in the last 10 days that it will hire temporary teachers to manage the classrooms. That CPC students and retired teachers, approximately 300, will be assigned to teach. This latter statement is an illegal one, is a legal act if the, if the ministry goes in that direction. Hiring persons to take place of persons during a strike is illegal. And I pointed out in the previous program, the Ministry of Education is not one of the essential services listed in law that allows the government and the union on strike to put in what is called a skeleton staff or temporary staff. So these, this is, Ministry of Education is not an essential service. So the fact that uh, they want to now hire people to take the place of strikers, this is called SCAPs or strike breakers, and this is not acceptable. And of course, the union, I'm sure, will remind the workers who and people they're hiring that they're, they're trying to break the strike. All of this, my friends, is reminiscent of the PNC tactics of the old. For those of you under age 35, you may be unaware of the manner in which the PNC, the major party within the APNU AFC coalition, uh, has treated with strike action in the past. Let me tell you some of the tactics, because some of you are maybe too young. When George Daniels, head of the GTUC in the 1980s, became critical for the first time of the government's policies and treatment of the workers, he was taken on a helicopter ride and offered to jump. 
Todd and, uh, Daniels and his family left the country quickly after that. Gordon Todd, head of the, of the Clerical and Commercial Workers Union, when he called for the government to take action to improve the workers' conditions, again in the late 80s, he too was taken on a helicopter ride. But Todd never left Guyana and remained a loyal trade unionist to the end of his days. When the bauxite workers went on strike in 1976, many were arrested and thrown into lockups in Linden, or what was called Mackenzie Police Station, and tear gassed. During shrew workers' strike in the 1970s and 80s, scab were used to go into the field to cut cane and to break the strike. So these tactics of divide and rule, intimidate and bully are not new. It has become the legacy of the 57-year-old People's National Congress. The union prior to the elections were given promises by the then opposition APNU. We know that a large percentage of the teachers supported the APNU in the 2015 elections and were active in GCOM polling day staff on May the 11th based on this pre-election deal, which Mr. Light, the president of the union, has publicly stated and reported on in the media that they did have these meetings and promises were made by the union, uh, to the union by the APNU AFC uh, before the elections of 2015. So the fact that they were patient and waiting was in the belief that the agreement or would be adhered to as promised in May 2015. However, they reached a limit and the teachers reached a limit, even if maybe some of the union leaders may have been willing for many reasons to allow the government and to give the government more time despite uh, almost three years that the teachers were not willing to wait anymore. And so clearly what has happened is the teachers and the union have been betrayed, as is the case with the public servants and the discipline services. The teachers and union leaders must remain strong and keep to principles and the labor laws. They are protected by those. The government has stated that one of its major platforms is education. Laudable and clearly critical to the advancement of children across the nation and for the development of our country. The APNU AFC went to the elections promising salary increases for teachers and public servants. It has delivered neither, and neither to either group. But is it true that the government cannot afford to pay out the salary increases to teachers? Let's examine this, because it's the crux of the matter. During last week's program, I referred to my colleague and parliamentarian Irfan Ali's analysis and findings when he examined the mid-2018 mid-year report. And this is available, as I told you last week, is on the Ministry of Finance website. He pointed out the, the enormous increases in expenditure for current and recurrent expenditure. And also pointed out that of every, um, that the, gov the government is spending less than 10 cents on wealth generation activities for the people and spending more of the money on what is a gross of misappropriation of funds, dietary, travel, etc. And so what in the things I wanted to quote re quote from last week is what he said about what this if the money was cut to twenty fourteen levels, what the money could be used for. And so Ali said by slashing all excess allocations from dietary and national and other events it's about $2 billion to the 2014 level. Enough funds could be garnered to rehire and offer a 6% 6 increase in stipend to all 1,972 dismissed uh, community service officers. He said he could lend to an increase in the National Two Child Council subvention by 222% to 50 million and provide each Armour Indian village across the country with a 3.5 million cash grant to fund development projects. Further, he went on to say that by removing all excess allocation from security services and transport and travel, $3 billion, reducing it to 2014 figures, the Because We Care cash program, cash grant program for every school child in Guyana not only could be fully reinstated, but each parent could now receive a 50% increase in allocations to 15000 per each child attending primary and nursery schools. He said in relation to the salary increases for teachers that there would still be an untouched $17 billion in employment costs and $24 billion in other charges, adequate funds to address severance pay, both the payment of severance to the sugar workers and increased salary for teachers. Last week, Thursday, at the opposition leaders' press conference, Mr. Jagdeo also looked into the government spending. 
listing several areas where you can cut back and use that money instead to pay teachers a better living wage. The former president said that if government is to cut back on its wasteful spending, it would manage to cover a reasonable increase for the country's teachers. He said, I quote, I believe there is money to fund a lot of which the teachers have been asking for without increasing overall expenditure in the budget. He pointed out <coughs> a few examples where the government bill has increased since 2015, in many cases double what it used to be before. He also reported that during the meeting with President David Granger, which was held earlier on the same day, last week Thursday, Jack Dew pointed out to the President that the government has a number of areas where it could find money to pay the sugar workers, including, and he specifically mentioned, I was there, so I, I was a witness, that the government has a corrupt contract where an individual is being paid $14 million a month for an empty bond, you remember? Sussex Street bond, Al Boystown totaling payments that are over $300 million that the government has paid to the use of this house called Bond, which is empty. This is what Mr. Jaguar said. If you terminate that contract alone, that could find the annual clothing allowance for all, all of the teachers. You just have to terminate that one project for that. The opposition, remember also the government had said two years ago they were considering co uh, stopping the contract. Well, they never did. And in Parliament, we found out in May that they'd expended over $300 million in the rental for this building that is unoccupied. The opposition leader also debunked claims that the teachers and the union are acting unreasonably. They've been waiting for three years, he said. In providing a further breakdown of how the demands of the teachers could be met, Mr. Jagdeer said he had even taken a look at the budget estimates to come up with how spending could be curtailed to facilitate the request. In comparing seven items from the current expenditure columns between 2014 and 2018, Jagdeer said there are enough monies that are being wasted that could be reduced and used to meet the demands. He pointed to the celebration of national and other events, which in 2014 had been budgeted at $477 million and now in 2018 being budgeted to 911 million. For dietary, that is food items, 3.6 million had been budgeted then, 2014, but in 2018 is now 5.2 billion. But that doesn't mean the prisoners are getting fed well. No, it does not. This has led to no improvement of persons in residential care, whether prison or the palms or anywhere else. The other category, what is called operating expenses, showed that $1.8 billion had been budgeted in 2014, but in 2018 it cost $2.6 billion. He said if you add these three, that's a $2.8 billion increase alone, he pointed out. Further, for travel, this is travel by the government, in 2014 it was $1.4 billion, it is now $2.1 billion. This indicates an increase of 732 million per annum. As for vehicle spares and service, in 2014, it was budgeted at 853 million, but in 2018, it has moved up to $1.34 billion. Other transport and travel, this is more local, was um, 874 million in 2014, but has now gone up to 1.3 billion. Rental of buildings in 2014 was 795 million, but has now gone up to 1.39 billion. This totals 2.2 billion in terms of increases. If these seven heads alone, that is national events, dietary, other operating expenses, local travel and subsistence, vehicle spares and services, other transport, travel and postage, and rental of buildings. These, these heads alone, we have an increased expenditure of $5.1 billion. We can easily cut these and find money to pay the teachers' wages and uh, restore, listen to this, restore the one-month allowance annually to each of the members of the discipline services, which, as you know, they used to get under the PVP and which was cut under this government. The money would also pay the debunching of the teachers' housing allowance, all these things. That's all there. 5.2 million we could cut. So we in the PVP are satisfied that there's money to, to pay the teachers and the reinstatement of the social safety nets produced by the PPPC government. 
The government is intransigent. It is their way or no way. However, when it came to the president, prime minister, vice presidents and ministers in regards to their own salary increases, within weeks of being sworn in, this was not a problem to find the money. By the way, that's costing us another $2 billion over the five-year period. The majority of teachers are female, at least that's what we know the figures. They've given themselves increases in allowance and benefits, which we're not privy to. The majority of teachers are female. Many are single parents, as we've said. And so in this worsening economic situation, all working people are feeling the squeeze. So too teachers. The Ministry of Education budget has grown astronomically, yet nothing much has changed. Teachers continue, as I said earlier, to use their money to buy materials, to make teaching aids for their students. They have to pay back, like everybody else, electricity, water, essential items. And they will have, as I said, to pay the new increases for the minibus and the water rates. I hope, too, that the union will understand that with prudent fiscal management, there is money to pay the teachers their deserved increases. I hope that the union and the teachers will not be intimidated and hold on to their position and stand firm on the rights and issues that have not been addressed. The President admitted at the Coffee 2002 50 Forum that 37 people, 37,000 people are unemployed and called on his audience to reject denialism. But isn't he the one who is in denial about the state of Guyana under his leadership, about the unfulfilled promises to the Guyanese people? Guyanese people cannot deny that promises were made. They cannot deny that those promises have not been met. And so I hope that the, the anti, what I call the anti-working people, anti-working class nature of the government is unraveling more and more. It has been shown more and more. And we've seen this in other areas too, of the way in which they run government, the legislature, the judiciary. This is an undemocratic government. Well, before we, uh, before we open for the calls, and I, I'm going to start taking calls, so please feel free to start calling in because I'm sure some of you will have opinions on all of this. But just to remind you as I'm waiting for the any calls that may come in, I, I should say that, that um, so the next item I just wanted to remind you on, which I will remind you every week as we go forward to November 12th, that um, local government elections, November 12th, and we've talked about mischief afoot by the government with the local government elections and with the new local authorities and the reduction of 16 constituencies from 14 ex existing local authorities. And so we pointed out what this has done with the boundaries, etc., and we dealt with that about three weeks ago. I repeat, uh, calling on the voters and all the local authorities to please check your names in the revised list of electors, which was produced by GCOM after the last continuous registration cycle, which ended on July the 8th, 2018. Okay, let me take a call coming in. So I'll pause on the local government issues and come back to that. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Manager of Public Importance. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to just say first, I don't care, not that I don't care, I'm not talking about the political platform. Either the option we have the other we have. One of the things that I find strange is statements made by President of the The reason why they give their raise to the big ministers and so is so that they would concentrate on the job. Yes. Their salary is far above the teachers. So are you saying that they're not giving the teachers a raise so that they wouldn't concentrate on the job? <laughs> the police, we're talking about police corruption. Their right. salary is so far below and you're not giving them the, the one extra month that they used to get. So they cannot concentrate on their job too. And this whole mis-settling that they're going on, it is not so every part of this country, everybody's feeling the squeeze. My problem, and I like to say it again, is this. When the sugar workers, now understand, I don't know everything about the super, so I don't know the ins and outs. But when they strike, the rest of the nation stays quiet. Now the teachers are striking, the rest of the public service. People need to understand that every aspect of this nation, the strike affects everybody. Businesses are affected. Families are affected, and at the end of the day, we all need to stand together. One thing I can say about Lyndon, and I need to praise them, is that they stand for whatever. Whether they're right or they're wrong, they protest wholeheartedly. The rest of the country seems to just take things up out of And I hope that we would wake up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for calling in, and I think you've made an important point. 
and I think this is where the some of the challenges we face as as a country. But when the sugar workers seven thousand, well, the first group Wales, um, it was treated differently. And of course, with the closure of the three estates, you know, totals over 7,000 workers have lost their jobs. The teachers haven't lost their jobs. They're on strike for legitimate reasons and, and reasonable demands. But the sugar workers were fired, terminated, closed down estates. They have not got their benefits. They have not got their severance pay. Um, even their pension fund and so on is all up in the air right now. So you're right, why didn't why didn't all of Guyana support? And maybe we have to go through this process as a people to recognize, as you correctly pointed out, that what affects one set of people affects another. And the workers of this country are being affected, all workers, regardless of who they voted for, regardless of what race, what class, regarding where, which part of the country, that they're all finding tremendous difficulties in managing. And I think that's the important point that you've made. And I hope that this, yeah. this period and the, the protests of the teachers will also um, give a lesson to all of our, our people that, you know, what affects one affects all. And therefore, we must never let what happened to the sugar workers and their closures, the closure of these estates, go as quietly ever again. And this time is not too late for other unions to stand in support of the sugar workers to make sure they get their severance pay. And the other benefits, their pension fund and everything else, which they contributed to in good faith as workers with agreement with the board. And so we have another call coming in, and we'll take that one as well. I'm just waiting. Um, so we have to we have to be, as, as Mr. Light pointed out, you know, that um, when he took a position against the PVP, he was okay. When he takes a position, critical of the government now, he's being accused of being opposition. So this is what happens in Guyana. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon, Ms. Bishira. Yes, good afternoon. I, I, I don't want to be funny, but um, I think this government got a problem with books and learning and enlightenment. First, you have Ms. Basil Williams interested in Anil Nandalal book. And he ain't learn nothing. Then you have the president saying he don't want guys to go on the books. No, they don't want the teachers and the students to have anything to do with their books also. Enlightenment is something they are not interested in. They want to go back to the future, not go forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, um, the, the government is full of contradictions. It wants education. It wants to do better. It's putting enormous amount of money. We thought we had a large budget for education. Theirs is huge, but it's not showing the kind of results. And part of it is that they've made the ministry top heavy. So, you know, uh, when you look at uh, agencies, you have it like this, like a pyramid. So it gets smaller at the top. What has happened to the number of the government agencies they have kind of burgeoned out the middle so that you have a large middle upper uh, part and, and so it's very disproportionate and this is where he, the huge salaries are. Not at the grassroots level, not at the level of, um, for example, in the case of teachers at the teachers level. Let me take another call. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Madison Public Hello? Relations. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, welcome um, to the program. I'd just like to, to let you know and the entire PVP to know that this, this teacher's struggle is not a political struggle. It is a humanitarian struggle. I, I know for years, for years, even for decades, the PVP imposed 5% on the teachers. 5%. And now you have the gall to get on television and talk about how all the hardship. Teachers were suffering all those years. A few people got duty free concessions. Don't make it sound as though. A whole lot of head teachers got GDP concessions. During the PVP time, only head teachers got, you know, only head teachers got, yeah. you know. Well, that was the agreement. Huh? That was the agreement. Have you read the multi-year agreement? Yeah, but what I'm saying, what did I'm saying, others did not, the 
that is one fulfilled. That agreement was one fulfilled. It was a, they were not. At certain levels. They it was were not. The board, and you know that. They I were not. Negotiated by the union. Because I, I was a teacher, I know that. Well, that's good. Mm, but I know, you know that. The, the issue is, though, is that the you can say a worker strike is not political. It, it's not supposed to be. But you or yourself are making it political by not allowing me or the party I belong to to speak on it. That's the most undemocratic and a, 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 a violation of my human right as a citizen of this country to speak on an issue. Whether it is a humanitarian, economistic, trade union, or political, I have a right to speak on it. And the party I belong has a right to speak on it. And you can't muzzle me by telling me that. So that the workers of this country, when it was the sugar workers, you didn't call in on this program, nor have you said anything as a former teacher about the suffering of the sugar workers and the fact that 7,000 people lost their jobs. I didn't hear anybody in some of the unions speak on their behalf or lend support. The silence was deafening. And so I have a right on this program until I'm removed from the program to express a view. And the view is that the PPP the fact is, the multi-year agreements, which were two in the making, were negotiated with the unions, the union heads at that time. And that those were the conditions that were agreed to. There were some logistical problems in the very beginning because the unions had to provide the list of persons in the schools, in the teaching profession, who qualified in the criteria that was set up to get duty-free concessions. So, and there were also some other logistical problems in the first agreement in particular. But the point is that it didn't lead to a strike because people were able to sit around a table in a manner which were treating each other as equals to resolve an issue. The point, sir, on this matter is that the teachers have been extraordinarily patient. The union has been extraordinarily patient to have meeting after meeting and gaps between the meetings when nothing is happening from December 2015 right through to August 2018. And so they have a right to strike and people in this country have a right to support them. Just like the media and others have the right, I assume, to attack them and say that they're not justified or the Minister of Labor saying that they're selfish and caring. But Mr. the sir who's called in, I have a right to speak on this. And it is not political by the fact that I speak on it. It is because it is unjust. This is unjust action by the government in relation to the teachers. Whether you want to see that any struggle for justice is political, you are free to go ahead and say that. But this is a just struggle. As the struggle of the sugar workers to keep their jobs in the sugar industry was just as well. And so justice must not be silenced in this country. It mustn't be given a label in order to silence people. And the PPP will not be silenced because it has a right as an entity to make an opinion and to give an opinion. And more than that, we've been able to point the way forward to show the government where the money can be found. And if you as a person calling in and a former teacher is not concerned about the fact that this matter must be resolved, and that there is money to be found. And it's not we who said they couldn't find the money. It is no less than the president saying that they had to go search for money. So we're just trying to be helpful. I'll take the call from the next person. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. So we will be, so I'm, I, I hope the call is clear on a number of matters. You know, this attempt at every time, this is what Mr. Light talks about. When he was anti-PPP and I had criticized the PPP, the PNC loved him. Now that he's criticizing the government, which happens to be run by the PNC, he's now being labeled PPP. And is that the way we're gonna solve the problem in this country? Is that the way? Labeling people so as to shut them up, to intimidate them, to bully them? Well, I'm sorry, sir, I'm not gonna be bullied and I'm not gonna shut up neither as a citizen of this country, nor as a member of the People's Progressive Party. Good afternoon, welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Yes. Are you hearing the me? The teachers deserve a raise of pay. Yes. Under your administration, they get their 5% more than I talk about the benefits they used to get. Mm. 
uniform allow, when traveling allow, and housing allow, but they are not getting nothing up right now. Yeah. So what I'm saying, that the teachers deserve a pay. They raise the, the salary because they said they don't want no fraud, no teeth and things. If the teachers get to raise a pay, they will be taking more interest in the children them, and you will be getting better students and better quality of children coming out of the school. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your support for the teachers' rights. I hope you won't be labeled as being political and lending your support to the teachers. The, the issue of workers in this country is that the issue is being raised. Are they just? Are they legal? Are they reasonable? And one thing about the workers of this country and the trade union movement of this country in the last three years, they have been unbelievably reasonable, extraordinarily patient. They have given the government a long rope to try to meet them quarter way, half way, three quarter way, whatever. And it has just not happened. And so that's why I'm saying on this program, fundamentally, the PNC, the major player, the number one player in the Abnu AFC government, is fundamentally, after 57 years, still what it was in the 70s and 80s, anti-working people, anti-working people. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. You, could, could, you don't need to represent yourself. As a political <laughs> opposition, they did your job. Thank you. Masters of national interest, you are, ne you are part of the legislative, you are part of the political opposition, and you have a right to speak here. Secondly, over the years, the PVP was in government, and believe you me, I could call my name Stanis Lazara. I did not vote for the PVP, and AFC knows me. The AFC and, and TNC was in opposition, and they come out and spoke of them, martial of issues and strikes and everything. So how is it wrong now? And that's the problem I have with this country. Yeah. I thought we'd gone forward. But yeah. when one people want to talk, they can talk, and the other can talk. And that's the problem the government has with the teachers. They are actually saying, without saying, how are you striking against we? We? Exactly. And that's what they're saying, and that's wrong. This country can't pass that. If the politicians are still there, we are not there. We are standing for right and wrong. We are not dealing with race and parties. We're dealing with right and wrong. And if you're right, you're right. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. And in this case, points that the people be making, they're right. Somebody has a problem with it. Again, I'm in San Francisco. Let know who I vote and who I can pay for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being so forthright. You know, I think that's an awakening that we need in Guyana that we can have our differences of views. Um, but nevertheless, what is right is right. And I, and I do know that we faced many, many strikes when we were in government. Some isolated, we even had strikes by the sugar workers. Some of them, some of them, the number of days lost in strikes against the PV, during the PUP government by the sugar workers union, if you check the record, it was higher than any other union against the PBPC in the last 10 years. And before that, of course, you had the 57 day strike by the, I think it's 57 days, by the Public Service Union. So we know about strikes. We've, we've encountered that and we know the difficulties. But we do know that ultimately, that in the case of the Public Service Union, it led to arbitration. And the, the head of that at the time was a gentleman called uh, Aubrey, Aubrey Armstrong, who had agreed to by both sides, both the PBP government and the, and the union, the Public Service Union. And, and that recommendation of that arbitration came out with very large increases for the public servants. And we had to comply. We had to comply. We were the government and the law. We can't break the law. And so there are, there's a natural friction between governments and trade unions, between employers and employees. There's a natural friction, a natural tension. The matter, though, is how these contradictions and differences are resolved. And in the case of the teachers, in the case of the sugar workers, they have been ba handled abysmally bad, uncaring for the workers and their families, the economy, the, the, the country in totality. So let me quickly say, local government elections, check your list, my dear friends. Make sure you know which list you're on, which constituency you're on, where you're going to have to, you have an idea, write it down. So when they print the polling stations list, you'll be able to know where you have to vote. And if you're not sure in your community, there are PPP members who would be able to help you who, uh, as we go along towards November 12th. Remember, November, uh, September 21st is nomination day. 
So the political parties, individual contestants, will be um, putting forward their, their nominations. That's the law. And so we will see that. But it's important for you now to make sure that you're on the list, that you can vote, and we show our strength at the local government elections, as the people of this country, as the citizens of the country, that we don't want the APNU AFC. We must signal to them that what they've been doing to the country over the last few years is unacceptable and that we want a change. So I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. I know that uh, I think yesterday was the end of the uh, last day of the exhibition at um, Sophia for the Amerindian Heritage. I found it rather short. It used to, my memory, go longer, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but that's the last of that in, um, at the exhibition site. There will be activities across the country in different villages. Unfortunately, they're not popularized and publicized as, as normal, and so we're not quite sure. I went to Karao and was pleased to meet people from Batavia, Karao, um, uh, Agatash, and so on, and so Kalkun. And so it was good to be out there uh, to, to meet people. Let us ask you to please drive carefully. Don't drink and drive. We need everybody to be alive and strong. This is, we have a country to build after 2020. And so we want everybody to be safe and strong and healthy and ready to put their shoulder to the wheel. So stronger we shall, and silent we shall not be. Silence is the greatest enemy to democracy. Silence makes those in power think they can get away with anything. Silence helps those who want more control and less democracy, those who want to move this country to a police, police state. And at the next elections, the people will make their votes count again. And we in the PPC shall have to start all over again, as we did in 1992, to reconstruct, to put this economy back on a firm and stable footing and restore the programs which help the people and the vulnerable, those at risk, and restore the independence of the judiciary and legislature from the interference of the executive. So you stay good, stay strong. We will see each other next Thursday, right here on Channel 6. Stay strong. Take care. Bye-bye. Ta-ta. The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of CNS Channel 6.